Isaiah 9 reads like this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there'll be no end he will reign on david's throne and over the, his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's quite a promise. Let's now turn to Matthew's Gospel. I'm just going to pick up some uh, passages from almost at random from this gospel. I'll start with chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, or Judea, as a Jew would say, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering wheat into his barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Verse 12 of the next chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, and by the way, if you preach like John, you will be put in prison. He was not known for tact. I'm preparing a sermon or even a book on the tactlessness of Jesus. Remember when he was invited to a meal? after he'd preached and somebody thought they'd invite the visiting preacher for Sunday lunch. And he sat down he said, I noticed how some of you grabbed the top places. That was his opening in conversation. <laughs> and then he said to his host, and by the way, you didn't show me the cloakroom beforehand. You didn't ask me to wash my hands. And his sheer tactlessness Prophets are known for truth, not tact. We need a few more prophets around. 
When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said by the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great life, light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Same message as John the Baptist. Chapter 5, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Turning over the page, verse 9 of chapter 6, Jesus says, This is how you should pray. In fact, I'll start at verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The end of chapter 6. Verse 31, so do not worry saying what shall we eat nor what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Chapter 13. Verse 24, well, no, I'm sure you know the parable of the wheat and the tares, so let's pick it up at verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch on its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, 
let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And that's what I hope to do this morning. You see, he's virtually saying, if you understand the New Testament, you'll also understand the old, and you'll be able to bring the old and the new together. If you've been instructed in the law and in the kingdom, the old way of the law and the new way of the kingdom, you can see together. You can see the purpose of the whole. And so we've spent three mornings in the Old Testament. I've spoken about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, and the kingdom of Israel. And that's all in the Old Testament. I could have said everything I've said so far from the Old Testament. Now I sense today is a bit of a watershed. We're moving into the new. But we're able to bring things new and old out of our treasure. And we're able to see the Old and the New Testament as one story of God's re-establishment of his kingdom on earth. Now, I want to spend about five minutes on the Old Testament again. Just to go back to remind you where we left the story yesterday. The Jews were left looking forward to a day when God in his sovereignty would step back onto the stage of human history and with his power re-establish his rule on earth. And they believed he would do it primarily with the nation of Israel and from there would spread his rule to the nations to the ends of the earth. Uh, I'm rather excited whenever I read in the Old Testament of the distant isles because that refers to the British Isles. It really does. In those days, in the days of Abraham, in fact, they used to send to Cornwall for tin. The Phoenicians knew about these islands. And when you talked about the most distant parts of the world in those days, you talked about the distant isles, the furthest the sailors went, which was here. Now, I'd, I'm not a British Israelite, don't get me wrong. But uh, I'm just excited whenever I read in the book of Isaiah that it will be told in the distant isles. That's coming true today. You're hearing it in the distant isles. And so God's hope for the future was that his promise that he would establish his rule on earth, not just in Israel, but to the distant isles, to the ends of the earth. And so to the Jew, the phrase, the kingdom of God, meant for him the day when God would reestablish his rule on earth everywhere. And they believed also from what the prophets had told them that he would do it through a king, a descendant of David, of God's choice, an even greater king than David. Now that was the heart of the Jewish hope. Those who knew their Bibles well, their Old Testaments well, also knew that God had made certain promises about the subject side of the kingdom as well as about the sovereign side. But conveniently, most of them overlooked that. You see, I tried to tell you yesterday the problem right through the Old Testament was not 
with God's sovereignty, but man's subject. That's my burden for this week. Time and again, the people of Israel said, God, will you demonstrate your sovereignty? Will you visit us with your revival? They said, oh, will you rend the heavens and come down? And time and again, God said to them through the prophets, I will be your sovereign, but will you be my subjects? The root of the problem was not that God wasn't acting in sovereignty, but that his people would not be his subjects. And I want to tell you this, it is hypocrisy to pray for revival if you're not willing to be God's subject. It's hypocrisy to say, God, come and take over Scotland, lay bare your mighty arm, we've prayed and prayed, if you are not at the same time willing to be his subject. It's hypocrisy. And it was that kind of hypocrisy that the prophets laid bare. But the big difference between the Old and the New Testament is summed up very simply in this way. In the Old Testament, God said, I will exercise my sovereignty and release you. But will you live righteously? In other words, in the Old Testament, the kingdom was made up of an offer and a demand. Do you follow me? God offered release but demanded righteousness in response. The New Testament does not do that. In a word, the New Testament offers release and offers righteousness. In other words, God promised not only to help them on the sovereignty side, but to help them on the subject side. Isn't that beautiful of God? And so he was saying virtually, I realize the problem is your subjection. You can't make it. You can't keep the laws. You can't keep the covenant. So the prophets said God was going to make not only an act of sovereignty to restore his kingdom, but he was going to help subjects to be subjects. In two ways. First, by forgiving their sins and second, by pouring out his spirit. And frankly, you'll never be a subject of the king without first experiencing the forgiveness of your sins and then having the Holy Spirit poured out on you. And isn't it beautiful that righteousness is no longer a demand? That also is now an offer. So the prophet said, in the last days, I will make a new covenant with you. I'll forgive your sins. And I'll write my laws, not outside you, but inside you, so that you want to keep them. What an offer. Even in the Old Testament days, there were some, Abraham was one, King David was another, who realized that in his heart, God wanted to help with subject as well as sovereign. And in fact, King David's prayer after he'd messed around with Bathsheba is a remarkable prayer. He said, Lord, I was conceived in sin. I'll never make it. Renew a right spirit within me. Create a new heart in here. Do something. Don't take your Holy Spirit away. So even in the Old Testament, there were those who realized that righteousness is not what God demands from you, but what God offers to give you. That's good news. The Mosaic Covenant was bad news. The Mosaic Covenant was, I'll release you provided you keep all the commandments and produce righteousness. And it's a cul-de-sac, it's a non-starter. The good news of the New Testament is that God says, I'll not only be your sovereign, but I'll also be the subject in you. Do you know, that was the start of the Reformation, as we call it. Martin Luther was trying to be righteous before God, and he meant business. And Martin Luther would flog himself until he fell unconscious in his monastery cell to try and get sins out of himself. 
and in a thunderstorm he fell on the ground in terror of a God who might strike him dead and he knew that he hasn't produced righteousness to get by the day of judgment. And Martin Luther searched the Bible and every time he read the word righteousness he cringed. It was a horrible word to Martin Luther because it stood for a level of right living that he couldn't get up to. And then one day, like a flash of illumination, he realized that the phrase, the righteousness of God, means what it says. And that God says, I've got enough righteousness for myself and for you. And when Martin Luther realized that God was not only willing to be his sovereign and release him, but also willing to be in him the subject and give his divine righteousness to Martin Luther, he was free and the Reformation began. Bold I approach the eternal throne and clothed in righteousness divine. Listen, you will never make it. You'll never be good enough. The good news of the kingdom in the New Testament is I've got enough righteousness for you as well as me. That explains why it was prostitutes who got into the kingdom first in Jesus' day. It also explains why the religious people didn't get in because they were still trying to be righteous. I hope you're getting excited in your heart. I'm touching something very fundamental. The Old Testament didn't work because the people couldn't make themselves subjects. They wanted the sovereignty. Now the key to understanding the ministry of Jesus is that his primary concern was to get subjects for the kingdom, not to establish the sovereignty. And you'll only understand the conflicts that he went through and the reason they put him on the cross if you realize that the crowd wanted him to be king, whereas he was wanting them to be his subjects. And he wanted not only to release them from the kingdom of Satan, he wanted to give them righteousness. And it was only the bad people who realized that what they thought was a hopeless situation was in fact the very doorstep into the kingdom. It was the irreligious people who'd given up trying to be righteous who discovered the kingdom of God. Well, I'm rushing ahead. I don't know. I keep getting... I have notes, but I never seem to get back to them. Sorry. When Jesus was born, there was a whole lot of royal language used. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now, there were very few who could see beyond Israel. Most of them were looking for a king of the Jews. And that was because for five or six hundred years, Israel had been slaves in their own country. They hadn't been slaves in Egypt or Babylon, but in their own country, they'd been under the heel of the Persians, the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Only for a few years under a group of, or a family of Jews called the Maccabees did they have a measure of political freedom, but it quickly disappeared. For those five or six centuries, they were under an enemy authority in their own land. Never mind Egypt or Babylon. And so they naturally longed for someone to release them in their own land. They were looking for a king of the Jews. Furthermore, for 400 years, God hadn't said a word to them. It's a long time to be out of touch with someone. And for 400 years, there was no prophet. Nobody said, thus saith the Lord. And that's why there's a gap of 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. There were books written in that period. We called them the Apocrypha. But they shouldn't be in your Bible because while they're interesting, there's not a word from God in them. God was totally silent for 400 years. Now, history went on. Do you know what happens when people don't hear from God? 
directly. They get into theological argument about the Bible. You get scribes. They have no immediate word from God, so they have to pick and pick in the written word of God, and they finish up in liberal and conservative theological schools. And that's what happened. They call themselves Pharisees and Sadducees. I tried to remember these two at school, and I could remember the Sadducees easily enough because they didn't believe in, a, in an afterlife, and so they were Sadducee, and I could always remember that. <laughs> and then the Pharisees, I remembered them because they, they did believe in an afterlife, and so I used to say, far I see, and, and that reminded me what they were. But they split up into all these different theological groups. Why? Because they hadn't heard from God. When you hear the living word from God, you, you can't spend a lot of time in theological argument picking and nitpicking at texts. So they had the Bible, they had the words of God in the past, but they had no word of God in the present. And then suddenly it went round Israel like a prairie fire, the rumor, have you heard? There's a prophet again. Now when you've waited 400 years to hear from someone, that's exciting news. And people said, where is he? He's down by the Jordan River. And he dresses just like Elijah used to. Can you imagine the wave of excitement? When you've been waiting for God to say something and waiting for God to do something for centuries. When grandparents would take their grandchildren on their knee and say, one day God will speak again. One day God will send a king and he'll release us from all our troubles. And the voice of God was heard again. And they just went to him from every quarter to hear what John was saying from God. And he said, get baptized. And it caused the same controversy then that it causes now. Why? Because no Jew had ever been baptized. It was all right for Gentiles, but not for Jews. We're in the covenant people. We belong. My parents were Jews. My grandparents were Jews. I'm in. I was born into it. And John the Baptist's message was, don't you dare think you belong because your parents belonged. He said, the kingdom's very near, so you better get cleaned up. You better have a bath. You better confess what's dirty in your life and get it cleaned out because the kingdom's coming. And when the kingdom gets established, everything dirty is going to go. So you better get yourself cleaned up before the king comes to clean the whole place up. Isn't it interesting? We always want God to clean everybody else up. God, will you come and put them right? And will you come and stop them doing that? And We want God to clean the place up, but not me. And John the Baptist knew where the kingdom would begin. It would begin when somebody said, I want my life cleaned up. Some of you may have heard me tell this story in Motherwell, but um, I know of a young man who two and a half years ago was a hell's angel and as far from God as you can get. And he, he was into everything. And then he became a Christian and Christ straightened his life up and he wanted to be baptized. In fact, he knew that God was telling him to be, to, to wash away his past. And he didn't want to be because he was covered in tattoos from his waist to his neck. I love Lucy and all the rest of them, you know. And, and he noticed when you went into water, your shirt went transparent. And he, he noticed that church people didn't seem to go in for tattoos. And he was a bit embarrassed. But he was more than embarrassed about one of the tattoos. When he was a hell's angel, he'd had the devil tattooed on his body. And there was Satan for all to see on his body. And he thought, how can I be baptized and then see that? So he went to a plastic surgeon and he said, could you do anything about this? And the surgeon said, not on the national health. That's, a, that's cosmetic surgery. But he said, I could try and do a skin graft, but it'll cost you a lot of money. It'll take a lot of time. And this lad thought, well, I, I don't have the money and I want to get on with it. 
So he decided to be embarrassed and he asked for baptism. And he went down into the water to wash away his past and to bury his past. And when he came up out of the water, one of the tattoos had gone. Just one. The devil was washed off his body in the water of baptism. That's what baptism is meant to be. It's a sign of the kingdom. It's to wash away your past. It's to say, I'm making a clean start. I want to be clean because the kingdom is going to be a clean place. And I want to get cleaned up before the kingdom comes. And so John the Baptist said, you better repent. Those of you who got too many clothes, go and get rid of some. Give them to the poor. Those of you who are fiddling your accounts, go and get your finance straight. Those of you who have been bullying others, you better stop fighting. He was a very practical preacher. Sort of preacher that some... I heard a preacher like this in the States and somebody said to him afterwards, uh, stick to the gospel and keep off chicken stealing. And some people like nice gospel sermons that never touch anything, you know. But John the Baptist, he touched things. He said to the king of the country, you shouldn't have that woman as your wife. It's not legal. You know that according to Jesus' teaching, whereby those who remarry, a divorcee, are living in adultery, that would apply to number 10 Downing Street and number 11 Downing Street. But where are the Christians who are prepared to get up and say that? John the Baptist was fearless in putting his finger on things that wouldn't match up with the kingdom. And he said, you better get cleaned up. Now, it's interesting that John the Baptist didn't heal anybody. There wasn't a single miracle happened in his ministry. No signs, no wonders. Just the word of God. An amazing man was John the Baptist, and he paid for it with his life. He'd lived a lonely life. Been out in the desert with God ever since he was a boy. And God had said, John, the king's coming. It was the custom in those days, as it still is, that if royalty is visiting or coming to a place, someone is sent before to get the place ready. If the Queen's going to come to Kinusi, I'll guarantee there'll be somebody from Buckingham Palace here months earlier to say, get ready, the Queen's coming. Buy a red carpet. Clean up that rubbish. The Queen's coming. John the Baptist was the one who had to come and say, prepare the way of the Lord. Fill up the valleys, reduce the mountains, get a decent road straight in so that he can ride in. And the king came, and it was Jesus. And his message was exactly the same as John's. Repent for the kingdom here it's right among you now and if you study carefully the implication is very clear Jesus was saying I am the kingdom he said the same things about himself and about the kingdom so that they were synonyms they were interchangeable terms that's an incredible thing to say and you can imagine the excitement at the beginning of his ministry at the announcement the kingdom of God has arrived. Now we want to look at the implications of that because his congregation went down from 5,000 to 12 overnight. He began with a huge following and it dwindled and dwindled until he finally said to the few that were left, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, no. What you say is what we've been waiting to hear. Now the puzzle is, why did Jesus become so unpopular? When at the beginning, he didn't even need to book a hall, he didn't need a publicity agent. Just the fact that he was in town was enough to pack the streets of people who wanted to meet him and hear him. And the reason is, very simply, that he refused 
to concentrate on the sovereignty of the kingdom. But he went hard after finding subjects. And it wasn't so spectacular. Now let's look first at the sovereignty that he did bring. I'm amazed that there was never a situation in which Jesus was at a loss or out of control. It didn't matter whether it was a, a mad demoniac or whether it was the storm on the Sea of Galilee or whether it was 5,000 people with nothing to eat. There was never a situation in which it wasn't in total control. Even when they tried to throw him off the cliff at Nazareth, he was in total control. You could see the sovereignty of the kingdom in Jesus. He was king of every situation. If, if he met a funeral in the road, he would tell the corpse to get out of the coffin. He was king of disease, king of death, king of nature, king of everything. So much so that when they saw what sovereignty he had over every human need, over every human circumstance, over everything, they said, we want to make you king. They offered him the throne within about six months of his beginning his ministry. And he refused it. They said, but, but this is what we've been waiting for. You are the king. And, and we're prepared to march behind you, drive the Romans out, set up a throne in Jerusalem and put a crown on your head. We want you as our king, as the people wanted King David. We want you. And he refused it. Time and again, they recognized his sovereignty and wanted to have it publicly displayed. But every time he said no, and you know the reason? Because he knew what was in man and he wouldn't trust any man. We're told that because he knew that none of them were as yet his subjects. That's what he was after. And you'll find that where they wanted him to heal, he wanted to preach. One morning they woke up in Capernaum in the house where they were all staying, Jesus and his disciples, and his bed was empty and they couldn't find him anywhere. But when they opened the front door, the main street in Capernaum was jammed from end to end with sick people wanting healing. I used to wonder why there were so many sick people in Capernaum. I now know just down the road were the, was the health spa, the Harrogate of um, Galilee, Tiberias. And to this day, Jewish people from all over the world and Gentiles come to Tiberias to bath in the waters to try and heal their rheumatism. Cripples come to Tiberias to this day, to the hot springs. And so when they heard that there was a healer just a mile or two up the road at Capernaum, they just left the hot springs and whew, went. And Capernaum was jammed. And they said, but where's Jesus? We've got a revival on our hands. Look at the crowds wanting to be healed. And they found Jesus in the hills behind Capernaum. They said, what are you doing here? I came here to pray. Well, Lord, now you've prayed. There's a revival down in Capernaum. The streets jammed. Everybody's looking for you. And Jesus said, I'm going to the next town to preach. Did you ever notice that? Even when he healed people and got them released from their disease, they refused to become his subjects. I'll give you just one example. He met a man with leprosy, an outcast from his society. Because of his physical disease, he couldn't even go to his own family. And Jesus touched him. I was taken to a hospital for leprosy once. And... Uh, I had to force myself to touch them. And I, I confess I could only do it. This was many years ago. I could only do it because I had to keep reminding myself Jesus did. You know? There's a human revulsion. And Jesus touched him and said, Now I've released you from leprosy. I release you. You're clean. Now he said, I want you to be my subject and here are my first two orders as your king. Don't tell anyone and go and show the priest. 
Do you know what the next verse in the Bible is? So the man went out and told everyone everywhere that Jesus had cured his leprosy. Are you getting the message this morning? People were healed from all manners of disease. They were set free from demons. But Jesus couldn't find anyone to be his subject who would obey his orders. Think of the climax of his ministry when he took the disciples up to the amazing place. If ever you go to Israel, you must go to Banias. That's the modern name for Caesarea Philippi. And there where the Jordan comes out of the Mount Hermon, just like it's strange, there's a rock wall and then the river just comes out 40 feet wide. Comes down inside the mountain from the melted snow and just comes out an under, underwater crack. And so you get this rock wall and the water just coming out. It, it's been a place of religion and superstition for millennia. And carved in the rock wall are niches where they put all sorts of gods. There was the god Pen who was a god who appeared in the form of a man. There was the god Caesar, who was a man who claimed to be God. And all these god-men and men-god in the niches uh, were there when Jesus took his disciples. What a place to take them. And as they looked at these statues of god-men and men-god, Jesus said, who am I? Who do men think I am? And they said, well, men think you're a reincarnation of some great man from the past. Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist. And who do you think I am? And Peter, bless him, said, you are the Christ. Now, the word Christ is a religious word to us, so let me translate it. You are God's anointed king. And Peter said, I recognize, he was the first man to say it. Demons had said it before, but Peter was the first man to recognize. You are the Christ, you're the king. And so Jesus said, that's right. It was my father who helped you to that conclusion, Peter. And that's the truth. Now, Peter, the next step is for us to go to Jerusalem and for me to be crucified. Oh, no, you're not doing that. And can you see that Peter even recognizes the king but will not be subject? He will argue, he will rebel, he'll say, oh, no, I know better than you. And to his last day before Jesus died, Peter was telling Jesus what to do. Jesus said, I want to wash your feet, Peter. You're not going to do that, Lord. I'm sorry, no. He calls him Lord, but he won't let him do it. <laughs> That's hypocrisy again. And uh, Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, we're not partners. Can't be friends. And Peter said, oh, well, in that case, here, wash my hands, my head. Peter, I just said your feet. <laughs> Do you realize that right up to the moment Jesus died, he had not found one subject for the kingdom? He had released many. He'd exercised the sovereignty of the kingdom in many, many lives. But he had not found one who was utterly loyal to him. Even his nearest friends ran away. And Peter, who said, well, the others may let you down, but I won't, Lord, swore to a little servant girl that he'd never met Jesus. So that there's a sense in which the Lord's earthly ministry for three years was a failure, apparently. And in fact, on Good Friday, it looked an utter disaster. Here was the king who had come to re-establish the rule of God on earth. He's left without a single subject, and he's dead. And yet, you know, something had got through. Even a dying thief said, I believe you are the king and that you will get the kingdom. Could I have a place in it? That strange quirk of Pilate's flickering defiance at the end when he put a little notice above the dying Jesus. This is the king. 
to choose. A Roman centurion recognized his sovereignty and said, you've only got to say the word, my servant will be healed. I recognize authority when I come up against it. Now let me backtrack a little. The Jews expected God's kingdom to come on a national and on an international scale. And they were puzzled because Jesus didn't seem interested in either. He neither seemed to want to set himself up as king of the Jews, nor when the Greeks made an offer to have him, was he interested in them either. And the Greeks were sort of saying to Jesus, well, Jesus, the Jews may not want you, but come over and, and minister among us. We, we'll welcome you. But he wouldn't go there either. He concentrated on the kingdom as an individual thing first. Have you ever noticed that whenever he talked about the kingdom, he, he talks in terms of individuals. The kingdom of heaven is like a man looking for treasure. Like a man, like a woman hiding yeast. And it's almost as if Jesus said, I will establish the kingdom of God nationally and internationally, but the way I begin is with individuals. I cannot build a national and international kingdom unless I have individual subjects who are subject to the king. And so very early on in his life, he gathered all his followers to him, took them up the mountain and said, Now I will tell you what it is to be a subject in the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's how he began. Now listen. He said, if you're going to be a subject in the kingdom, there is to be no anger in your life at all. He said, you've heard it said you shall not kill, but I say, that's the king making his laws. I say to you, you mustn't even have contempt in your heart for anybody else. You mustn't call them a fool. Because to be angry with someone or to despise them is to be in danger of hellfire. That's not kingdom living. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Well, said Jesus, you may never have climbed into a bed with someone else's wife. But if you've looked at a girl and wondered what it would be like to have her in bed, that's not fit to be a subject in my kingdom. And he was very, very strict on divorce, far stricter than almost every denomination today. And he said, in my kingdom, there is no divorce, with the single exception of physical infidelity. And with that single exception, there is no divorce and if you've married a divorcee, you're living in adultery. And that's not the kingdom. That's not being subject. He went on that. Can you imagine? He lifted the standards of the kingdom far higher than Moses ever did. Now here's one that's going to get you if I haven't touched anything already. Subjects of the kingdom, he said, are not allowed to worry. Did you know that Jesus said more about worry in the Sermon on the Mount than about adultery? But when did a church last discipline a member for worrying? But Jesus said worry is a libel on your heavenly father. You're saying if you worry, my father cares more about his garden and his pets than he does about his children. Because he feeds the birds of the air and he looks after the flowers of the field. And therefore, if you're worried, you're saying, my father doesn't care. You know, I never knew our three children to worry about the next meal. Because whenever they came in, there was a meal for them. And if I had heard from a neighbor or someone or if my wife had heard from a neighbor... Uh, your children were telling me they're really worried as to, as to whether they'll get any food tomorrow. How do you think we'd have felt if the neighbors were talking about our kids like that? 
And Jesus said a subject of the kingdom trusts. Listen, the best welfare state you could ever belong to is the kingdom of heaven. You seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else is thrown in as a bonus. You'll always have enough to wear. You'll have enough to eat. The bills will be paid. If you're a subject of the kingdom. My, you read through the Sermon on the Mount and you think, that's impossible. I'll never be a subject of the kingdom. But Jesus refused to lower his standards one inch. In fact, he pushed them sky high. Literally, heaven high. And you'll find that in the last six months of his ministry, he got even worse. The last six months, he hardly healed anybody. He just laid it on thick. No man is worthy of the kingdom if he puts his hand to the plow and looks back. Unless you're prepared to give everything you've got, no use in the kingdom. The, the people who did follow me seems to have spent his time putting them off, saying, why are you following me? If you're prepared to take up a cross and die in it, okay, you can come. That's not the way to win friends and influence people. Jesus was determined to get subjects for the kingdom. But the amazing thing to me is this. The people who did follow him, even though he raised the standard so high, why? I'll tell you why. Because they felt instinctively that even though he set such high standards, he could help them to reach it. He said, my burden's light, my yoke's easy. Fancy saying that after preaching the Sermon on the Mount. But do you realize the significance of my yoke? A yoke is a piece of wood with two notches in it. And it links two animals together who then pull together. And when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, he's not saying, take the Sermon on the Mount and try and live up to it. He's saying, here, get under the other end of this with me and we'll pull together and we'll make it. So woman taken in adultery, you know, when she looked in Jesus' face and he said, go and sin no more, she began to believe she could. I'm amazed that Jesus had the capacity to teach the highest moral standards that anyone has ever taught and yet to be a friend of sinners. Usually when Christians moralize, they put sinners off. And he had the capacity of saying, that's the standard. But come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Those of you who can't make it. I wonder if you realize what the word sinner means in the New Testament. It doesn't mean cannibal. It doesn't mean criminal. Shall I tell you what it means? I love taking groups, or I did when I did it, love taking people out to Israel and introducing them to the land. And, and some people said, we love to go with you to Israel. We learn far more from you there than we do when you preach in church. And I, I said to one person, why? And, and they said, well, because you're just talking all the time and, and it's, it's just natural to be talking as you go in the way. Most of Jesus' teaching was not in a pulpit. It was while they walked along the road. And uh, one person who came with me recorded 14 hours, was it, of my comments on the bus? Um, but it seems natural there just to point to that. Look, there are some sheep and some goats. And uh, watch what that shepherd does with them. You know, it's just natural to. Well, I remember being on a bus on the last trip we had. And there was an Israeli guide, an Israeli driver. And I was speaking through the loudspeaker, through the microphone from the front. And I said, now, um, I think it's time I told you what a sinner was. Otherwise, you might not understand. We had just been through the Mir Shi'arim. That's the very orthodox quarter of Jerusalem where you get all the... Uh, Jewish Jews with all their ringlets and long 
coats and notices up about women's dress and all the rest. You know the kind of place. Um, and after we'd gone through this, and I was on the bus, I said, I want you to realize what a sinner is. I said, when you read the sinner, the word sinner in the Gospels, I want you to think of our driver and our guide, because they're sinners. And, and they sort of stiffened up and they <laughs> looked around. I said, a sinner in the Bible days was not a very bad person, but someone who'd given up on religion because they just couldn't make it. It was too heavy. And technically, the word sinner was for someone who didn't try and keep all the Sabbath laws. Just ordinary people who said, I just can't cope with religion. It's just too much. And got on with the business of daily living. Now, I knew the driver and I knew the guy. And I knew they were not orthodox. They were not religious. They had given up trying. It was too heavy. And, and I said, these are sinners. I said, do you realize that Jesus... If he was right here today in the flesh, it, it's our driver and our guide he'd be making friends with, not the people you've just seen in the Mir Shiarim who are desperately trying to keep the law. And you know, the driver and the guide went... <laughs> it's the first time they'd heard that Jesus was the kind of person who liked people who'd given up on religion because it was too heavy. I've just had a burden this morning that I, I got from the Lord. I, I believe it's prophetic. I believe that when God moves in sovereignty in Scotland, he's going to bypass the religious people. Religion is offensive to God, and in Scotland you have far too much religion. You better get your life cleaned out of religion if, if the kingdom's coming. I believe he's going to touch irreligious people in Scotland. People right outside. I had the privilege of listening to a glorious testimony not many months ago. From a girl who was a prostitute in Aberdeen. And who relieved the oil men of their money when they came off the oil rigs. And she had a bedroom which she wanted to be the finest bedroom in Aberdeen. She wanted the walls in black and the ceiling all mirror and a big bed and all the rest of it. She got the money for that bedroom in which to entertain all the men who came off the oil rigs. And then one day, no, uh, she finished up in the mental hospital in Aberdeen and her basic problem was simply that uh, men used her, they didn't love her. She felt no one loved her. And then one day she met Jesus in the streets of Aberdeen. And I tell you, she's now a princess. She's a lovely person. She's beautiful. She got the bedroom, not quite the same decoration. And she said, Jesus, from now on this bedroom is for you only. It's the king's bedroom. I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over that girl in Aberdeen than over all the religious ladies with their tight lips singing the metrical psalms on Sunday. Do you believe that? The kingdom welcomes the irreligious. And, and Jesus had big problems with religious people who were trying to work their passage and trying to be righteous. and trying. To, the, the most you can achieve of your own righteousness is you can get the outside right. That's the most you can manage. You can manage respectability, but you can't manage righteousness. You can get the outside right, but you can never get the inside right. And you can even sit at Holy Communion and have the most terrible thoughts inside and nobody else knows. You look very respectable, nicely dressed. Listen, that religiosity in Scotland is the enemy of the kingdom of God. And Jesus would call it today what he called it then, whitewashed sepulchres. Because I know also of a prostitute in Scotland who went looking for Christ in church and finished up in an elder's bed. Forgive me for being blunt, but Jesus was blunt. 
And Jesus called things by their real name. He wanted reality. And he'd rather have a crooked tax collector and a prostitute in his kingdom than religious people. And they would rather have it too. It says they seized the kingdom violently. They snatched at it as if it was their only lifeline. At last they'd met somebody who gave them some hope of ever getting out of the mess they were in. Now all this was very surprising to the Jewish people. It was a surprise to the religious leaders that he mixed with people like that. It was a surprise to the common people that he wouldn't be king when they wanted him to be king. But what was he after? He was after releasing people from the kingdom of Satan and helping them to be subjects of the kingdom of heaven. That's what he was after. And yet, as I say, it would look as if by the time he came to die, he had not got one. There were people who'd been raised from the dead. There were people who'd been healed of leprosy. There were people out of whom legions of demons had been cast out. Yet when the crunch came, only one person went to Calvary alone. And I want to tell you that on the day that Jesus died, the kingdom of heaven on earth was reduced to one person. One person. You see, not only was Jesus the perfect sovereign of the kingdom, in total control and power over every conceivable situation, but Jesus was also, listen, the perfect subject of the kingdom. He was the first person who throughout his lifetime had been subject to to the will of God perfectly perfectly and when he finally struggled in the garden of Gethsemane with the last call of duty where God had said you go to the cross now he sweated blood don't you ever think it was easy for Jesus to be sinless he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And he agonized. He said, Father, is there no other way? No other way? And what God was really saying to Jesus, if I can just uh, try and explain it for you, God was saying, Jesus, my son, you realize that there will be no subjects of the kingdom unless you go this way. Because you'll never be able to set men totally free from Satan unless you go this way. You've got to break the prince of this world's power and it's the only way it can be broken. And Jesus finally said, not my will but yours be done. He became obedient to death at the age of 33 when every instinct in us is to hold on to life. I hope you don't think this is irreverent, but I, I, I love to watch sheepdog trials. Uh, I used to be a shepherd in Northumberland, and I, I love working with a collie dog. And um, In fact, for 13 years after I was in the ministry, we had a collie dog in the home. I love to go to, for walks with that collie dog, and she was very obedient. Collies are marvelous. They, they sense the shepherd's mind. And I was watching that program, One Man and His Dog. Do you know the program? And, and on one particular program... The shepherd who got the second prize was interviewed afterwards for the BBC. And the interviewer said to the shepherd, I understand your dog has a plastic hip joint. Strange thing to say, but the, the, the shepherd said, uh, yes, that's right. The, the veterinary surgeon had to put a plastic hip joint in his rear leg. And he lay for two months on our kitchen table until it uh, grew together again. And the interviewer said, well, that's marvelous. That dog looks as good as new. And the shepherd said, yes. Did you watch him jump and run? He's, he's marvelous. And then the interviewer said, why did he need a plastic hip joint? And the shepherd's face crumpled up. And he said, well, one day I was in the farmyard. And uh, he said, I told the dog, stay, lie down, stay. And he said, the dog lay down. And uh, he said, the dog kept looking at me. 
and looking behind the barn. Looked at me, looked behind the barn. And he said, I wondered what it was looking at. He said, I couldn't see, but coming behind the barn was a huge tractor and trailer. And it was coming straight for the dog. And the driver was, of course, high up on the tractor and didn't see the dog lying there. And the dog stayed and let the tractor go right over its back leg. When I looked at that shepherd's face, when he said that, and how he felt about a dog that was so obedient that it would just have stayed there and died for the shepherd. I began, it's not irreverent, I think, to make a comparison. I just saw a little of God's heart. On the day that Jesus was hanging on a cross and people said, save yourself, get yourself out of the trouble. You've saved everybody else. You've proved yourself king in every other situation. Prove it now that you're the king of the Jews. Get off the cross. And he could have done it as easily as I talk to you now. But his father had said, stay. And he stayed. That day, Satan's power was smashed. That day, the kingdom of Satan suffered a mortal blow. A human being had stayed out of his kingdom for his whole life. And there was a foothold on earth in the human race for the kingdom of heaven on earth. It is true that Jesus died in our place and that he was punished for our sins all that is true but I think the deepest meaning of the cross is this that day he triumphed over principalities and powers and made a show of them openly he broke the power of the prince of this world and you know it is true that wherever the message of the cross has been preached Satan's power has been smashed and people have been released. And the blood of Jesus is more powerful than anything Satan can do. And you can deliver people from Satan and from his demonic powers through that one day's act. But I say again, the kingdom of heaven on earth was represented that day in one man only. Jesus. But he won. It's finished. It's completed. I've done it. And from then on, the kingdom could be reestablished. And subjects could be set free from Satan. Forgiven. Released. Do you know one of the things that Satan uses most perhaps to keep hold of people guilt guilt that strange mixture of fear and shame that then brings something out into the open and it's the hidden things in our lives that Satan uses to keep us chained isn't it that Jesus died in the darkness so that these things could be brought into the light and smashed The cross finally established the kingdom on earth. And the kingdom's never looked back since. It may have seemed a bit like a, a grain of mustard seed. <laughs> to the Roman Empire, it was just one among thousands of crucifixions out somewhere at the edge of the empire. But to the universe, it was the longest day. It was the turning point. After he had risen from the dead, Jesus spent six weeks talking to his disciples. What about? He had only one subject for six whole weeks. They went to Bible school for six weeks. It was the first time he'd given them any Bible study. But he took them through every part of the scriptures. The law, the prophets, the Psalms. And what was his theme? Very simple. The kingdom of God. 
If you read the first verses of the book of Acts, it says that for those six weeks he appeared alive to them, proved that he was alive with many infallible proofs. They knew he was alive. They knew he'd conquered even death itself. But it says he instructed them concerning the kingdom of God. And then he took them out to the Mount of Olives and they realized it was goodbye. They knew something was ending. Now, if you had the chance to ask Jesus one question only, personally, what would you ask him? If you knew you could ask one last question of Jesus, what would it be? It's very interesting. The disciples had walked with him for three years. They'd listened to him for six weeks, Bible instruction on the kingdom of God, the kind of thing I've been giving you here. Only it must have been marvelous to have Jesus interpretation but they said Jesus there's just one thing we don't understand you know that we expected the kingdom to be established nationally we believe you're the king of the Jews then Jesus why don't you get on with restoring the kingdom to Israel Now, you know, the common Christian answer in this country and indeed throughout the Christian world is unfortunately, that's a silly question. Jesus was finished with Israel. Israel had failed. And as Jesus said, the kingdom will be taken from this nation and given to a nation that produces fruits worthy of it. So the common conception is that the kingdom of God now has nothing to do with the Jews. It has nothing to do with Israel. It's been handed over to the church. Don't you fall for that one. Listen, whenever a question is asked, you should always listen to the premises of the question. Do you know what I mean by that? Because hidden in every question are certain assumptions, and if those assumptions are wrong, you shouldn't answer the question. For example, if you ask me, have I stopped beating my wife? That's a loaded question. There's a premise in it. There's an assumption in it. And I would not answer the question with a yes or no. Because either way, I'd be acknowledging your assumption that I once did. Do you follow me? And so if, if the disciples, for example, had said, Jesus, are you going to assassinate Pontius Pilate now? And he'd said, it's not for you to know when. What do you judge from that? That the question was a valid question. Now, when they said, will you restore the kingdom to Israel, there were four assumptions in the question. First assumption, that Israel once had the kingdom. Second assumption, that they didn't now have it. Third assumption, that one day they would get it back again. Fourth assumption, that Jesus was the king and the one to do it. Four premises behind the question. And Jesus didn't question any of them. And so I just want to warn you, the idea that now the church has got the kingdom and Israel has lost it will lead you to pride and arrogance which is totally out of place. As Paul says in Romans 11, I've quoted this already, the church could lose it and Israel could have it back again. <coughs> the kingdom is given to those who produce the fruits of it. The assumption that the organized denominations make that they have the Holy Spirit, that they have the kingdom, that everything belongs to the church, that is a most dangerous assumption. And there are empty church buildings all over these British Isles to prove it. Where God has written Ichabod over them and said, you're not my kingdom. Listen, we should realize that you only stand by faith in the kingdom. But what Jesus did say to the disciples was this. It was almost as if he was saying, change of plan. Instead of establishing the kingdom in Israel and having all the Gentiles come to it, I'm going to send you Jews to the ends of the earth to bring the Gentiles in. And we now know that it's God's incredible plan to bring the full number of Gentiles in and then to go back and pick up the nation of Israel and bring them in too. God in his sovereignty has decided to reverse the order. 
In the Old Testament, it looked as if God was going to establish the mountain of the Lord in Jerusalem and that all the Gentiles would come to it and that he would be king there and the Gentiles would come. But in fact, there has been a change of plan. And he said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, beginning here in Jerusalem. But I'm going to have the international kingdom established first. And then we'll come back here and bring them in. Oh, as Paul says when he says that, oh, the unsearchable wisdom of God. Who could have counseled him? Who, who could have told him how to do it? What an amazing plan. And so he sent the disciples out. But he said, there's one more thing. If you're to be my subjects, and if you're to demonstrate my sovereignty, you'll do neither without the Holy Spirit. So wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit's come on you. And then you go out. So tomorrow morning we'll have to talk about the Holy Spirit. Brian Hayes has already told you some things about that. I'll say a few more tomorrow morning. That's where the kingdom lies now, wherever the Holy Spirit is. Wherever the Holy Spirit is filling people, you will see two things. You will see the sovereignty of God being exercised, the same sovereignty Jesus exercised over demons and disease. And you will also see people whom the Holy Spirit has enabled to be subjects of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit doesn't just bring the sovereignty of the kingdom. He also helps us to be subjects. Well, that's the kingdom of Jesus. Oh, there are so many more things I'd love to have said. Jesus, I just want to thank you for the kind of kingdom you came to bring. A kingdom that offered release and that offered righteousness as well. So that it's one offer after another. And I want to thank you for the kind of people that the offer appealed to. Those who weren't religious and those who weren't righteous. And who had no chance of being either. And Lord, Lord Jesus, will you forgive us for our religiosity? Will you forgive us for our respectability? Lord, may your kingdom be righteousness and therefore peace and therefore joy among us. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you to be the king. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You reign. All authority in heaven and on earth is yours. You're the king of Scotland this morning. And we acknowledge your kingship. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us to proclaim that. Help us to tell people you're in charge. You're in control. Everything is in your hands. And we are joint heirs with you. That's incredible. That one day we'll reign with you. Lord Jesus, receive our praise. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Your name is Jesus. 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 Amen.